Thank you so much, Kathy, for the introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to today's panel discussion. It's such an honor to be moderating uh, the discussions by these two esteemed um, speakers whose works I really admire. So before we begin, um, I would introduce um, Dr. Imran Tajuddin, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Malay Studies and the Department of Communications and New Media at NUS, where he teaches topics on identity and representation through the arts, urban history, and built cultural heritage in maritime Southeast Asia. His, doc his doctoral dissertation on this topic won the ICAS Book Prize in 2011. He was named most promising new civil society advocate in 2015 for his active work on urban heritage awareness. He has published on historiographical challenges in art and architectural history arising from colonial encounters and received epistemologies. Without any further ado, Dr. Imran, please. Thank you very much, Nurul, for that kind introduction. And now, uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. I'm tuning in actually from uh, Oxford, where it's quite early in the morning. Uh, and I hope to be able to present to you something interesting uh, today. I hope I won't have to uh, speak too quickly, but I will try to not overrun my time. Uh, there's quite a lot I would like to share. And really, this is in the nature of sharing. A lot of what I'm about to tell you uh, comes from a position of not knowing and wondering and asking questions and still figuring things out. Uh, one of the things I would like to try and explore today with you uh, is this notion uh, that perhaps uh, is, uh, we might be uh, able to push beyond uh, the usual focus of agency in uh, colonial era photography uh, to try and uncover whether it's possible to see beyond empire. And so one way I thought of doing this is to look at not colonial photography, though it was attached to uh, colonial agency alone, but to try and look at it as colonial era photography. Uh, but what I found, and this is just by way of preamble, is that a lot of the photographs that we find in the archives, as opposed to private family collections uh, from the, let's say, 1880s, 1890s, uh, 1920s, 1930s, some Malay families, for example, do have these photographs. They have not uh, donated them to the museums. Uh, so they don't figure in the archives. So that's one of the limitations of the project. When we look at colonial era photography, we are constrained by what's available in the colonial archive, in our archival holdings, rather than photography at large from the colonial era. Uh, I say this because I have encountered two Malay families who have photographs from the earlier periods, so, but, but they have not donated these uh, photographs. So uh, that's, but coming back to our collection for the exhibition and for my presentation today, I am not showing, I have this, at first I wanted to show these other photographs with the permissions of the families, but I have decided against it, I will only focus on what we find in the colonial archives. And then I'm asking whether it's possible to, um, you know, uh, to, to just counter the kind of othering that we can see in these photo photographs. Uh, and whether it's possible to have uh, multiple, multivalent readings of uh, the visual material uh, that such uh, photographs uh, present us. So, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, is it possible to also try and find some uncommon images uh, with potential alternative narratives that they offer? Maybe it's also possible to ask, when does the gaze seem to shift when photographs are sometimes reused or circulated in ways in which they were not originally intended by the photographer? photographic subjects themselves. So some of these images are actually private studio portraits uh, of Malay women for them for their own consumption, but it seems that they then go into public circulation in the form of postcards. Uh, so those, those, that, that brings into question, you know, what kind of, uh, how do we read such images then and when they become in that sense, uh, misappropriated, would you, would you use, would you use the term misappropriated uh, in today's sense? Uh, and then of course, uh, the ways in which we read uh, some of these images as uh, stock images of the native figure type, when in fact, originally they were not intended as such, but they were relabeled as such. And so then, um, you know, these, these are some of the complexities. So the other thing that troubled me, so I'm, I'm very much troubled by uh, how I might uh, look at these images is um, how much variety do we get out of the images that we, uh, that we have from the archive? What has been left out? What are the archival silences? I mentioned earlier private collections. Um, there are many articles uh, in uh, the Malay newspaper of Singapore, for example, I can't speak of Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, where uh, the, the, the museums implore the Malay community to 
And the Malay community was not very forthcoming. Uh, it seems that is the case as against the other communities. And recently, an, another episode in Facebook has reinforced the fear of some of the Malay families about their old photographs being ridiculed later for memes and for whatever other purposes. So these are some complexities. But um, how much of the variety in life worlds of the colonial era for um, the Malay world do we actually get from colonial archives? Uh, how might we read, and, and given the limited nature of the archives, how might we read against the grain anyway and beyond the frame anyway? Particularly, I'm trying to today uh, focus on circulation, older and newer cosmopolitanisms, identity politics as observable through what colonial photography recorded both wittingly and unwittingly. Quite a lot to try, so I, I'm not sure I can finish everything. I'll be trying to share as much as possible. So ultimately, can colonial photography or colonial era photography be redeemed as sources? The first image I want to share is this one. Now, um, you notice that you can see the watermark. That's because the original looks like this. So it's not much better, actually, than the one that you can get online and I tried to enhance. The original is given to us in this manner. It's quite small. But the, this, this is an example. I want to start with this because it's an uncommon image. And actually, when the group, the, the research group I'm um, very fortunate to be with, uh, did a uh, an archival search uh, as a, a, a using a research uh, um, assistance. Uh, they were not able to uncover this. I remember seeing this though on my own. I, I stumbled upon this uh, in 2018, and uh, it was in, if I am not mistaken, uh, Picture SG. And I saved the URL, but Picture SG as a platform changed its web page design, and so I couldn't relocate it. In the end, uh, I've managed to found, find it again, and it's it's there. So this illustrates the difficulty of even accessing things that are in the colonial archive that might miss our search. And this is a very, very rare photograph. It's from either around the turn of the century of Rocho Girls School, Rocho Malay Girls School. And I recall that my late grandmother actually went to the school and she she learned how to read and write Jawin and arithmetic because of this. I learned that she went to the school because I asked her, I was the only member of the family at that young age of 12 to ask her this question. And she told me this because she corrected my 12 times table. And I asked her, how do you know? I did, I see with my bias, I thought my grandma wouldn't know these things. She told me that she was uh, educated in uh, Rocho Malegal School. But what's interesting about this photo though, is it tells us a lot about uh, one of the emphases of the education at that time. But it's not just colonial education for Malay girls. It was a then persisting gender role uh, kind of specialization for elite females in England, the US, Japan, and et cetera, to have these kinds of classes, for example, of knitting, crocheting, and other uh, uh, activities like this. So it's kind of skill that you pick up. Um, you know, it also has a carryover in liberal arts colleges for girls that are also in Japan, in New England, uh, et cetera. Um, but also, you know, there is this question of our ambivalence towards the effects and impacts of colonial education. And I wonder whether it's possible to move beneath and beyond these colonial lenses on modern education to look at the fuller context. So maybe one context is that it's actually in an album with bo Malay boys as well. Uh, sorry, that should be a Rocho, uh, Rocho school, not Rocho girls school. But also images of reformist Islamic education is notoriously difficult to find. Nobody has taken photos of that uh, or of other indigenous initiatives. So one indigenous initiative I want to bring into the picture is not in our project and it's not in the uh, exhibition either. Is uh, This is uh, in the open source. I mean, it's a release for public domain from the National Archives of the Netherlands um, uh, in Den Haag. And this shows the Kerajinan Amai Setia School, as far as we can uh, ascertain, uh, located at Kotogarang in West Sumatra, established by Rohana Kudus. That's a portrait that also in the public domain. So this is where a similar initiative was actually um, uh, uh, being broached by uh, Rohana Kudus in the context of West Sumatra. Again, it's got to do with skills uh, that, that uh, it was felt uh, girls should be equipped with in order for financial independence. So even our idea of what uh, education should be about is colored by our present day understandings of what constitutes proper education. Um, but I'll, that some of these images tell us a little bit more about the people who were in the uh, system. So there's also this issue of class. Went to the vernacular schools, as they were called, uh, under colonial 
uh, regimes? Uh, was it every single uh, Malay individual or only certain individuals? So some indication of this uh, can be had from some of the photographs. There are different Malay schools. There are three Malay schools actually in uh, Singapore, as far as we know. Uh, this is from the research that I did. There were three in the uh, early 19th, uh, sorry, uh, early 20th century. Uh, and uh, here we're looking at, again, Rochok Girls School, right? So Rochok Girls School is apparently for, uh, it's more on the elite side. Uh, I'm not sure how this uh, happened, but uh, it was along Arab Street where uh, today you find, what is that school called? Stamford School. So the building occupied by Stamford School stands on the site of what was the Rochok Malay Girls School. Um, Rochok Malay Girls School tended to be for the people who are from slightly more elite uh, backgrounds in town. Uh, the, the other two Malay uh, schools, Malay girls and Malay boys schools, were at Rocho, uh, which is around um, Hajar Fatima Mosque, and uh, would you believe it, in Kampung Kalang. So we, we'll look at that later. But in this image here, um, you can see the caption tells us, Johara, daughter of Dato Ramban. I suppose this is Ramban in Negeri Sembilan. So it tells us also about the circulation of the Malay nobility, right, who were, uh, you know, a new formed a new class of administrators huh, under the Federated Malay States. So she was wearing a necklace of old Turkish coins. So that tells us something about uh, even the choice of what to, to wear to school to show off that. So uh, th these two images are interesting because the one on the left is of another uh, school, um, but we don't know, and I, I'm not able to ascertain which one. The one on the on the right uh, is in the same folio, um, it's in the same album, sorry, of images. And it shows a boys' school. Uh, so that's interesting also because, um, you know, there is this point of uh, maybe if we only focus on the girls or the women, uh, then we don't get the fuller picture. But the image on the right seems to be uh, from, based on the photograph, seems to be from Kampung Kalang. So that's another um, uh, site for colonial education for the Malays at that time. Now coming to the next image of uh, these uh, maybe photographs that bring up more questions and answers uh, is this one captioned Malay Girls School Singapore. Uh, I've yet to be able to identify which building this is. Uh, of course, the first thing that um, struck me was uh, the building, the house. It's actually a comp what is called a compound house, quite a large sized one. Uh, and then uh, you have this group of Malays, Malay girls uh, who are attending school. So I think by now you're used to the fact that Malay girls and boys at that time, when they went to school, they were not wearing school uniforms, obviously. I think this was a point that was quite obvious to me, but struck other observers as peculiar. I, 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 I understand why. Uh, so they were dressing what we today would think of as miniature adult clothes, which at that time was just normal for children as well. And again, they wore jewelry. If you look carefully, almost all the girls wear jewelry, some necklace of some sort. It shows that they are from some elite or privileged background. Uh, to have gone to school. I was also struck by, I think you can see in the background, uh, two visitors about to step into the school. I assume they're visitors. There's somebody there in the typical dress of um, the Jawi Pekan or Jawi Pranakan, uh, a man with a songko um, and a, a coat, as well as the school matron here with her, um, with her white hair, surrounded by all the girls. Uh, in their myriad of uh, dress forms. So we wonder what uh, the context of this photograph was, why there are buntings and the uh, huge Union Jack uh, being displayed. Was it a kind of, um, a, you know, a kind of visit maybe by uh, a colonial education official? But uh, the kinds of dress that you see here, some are in a Western dress. There are two girls, three, four girls also in um, what we understand as Western white dress. And the rest are in... Um, various forms of dress that are more common in the Malay world. Uh, and on the, on the, in comparison with the photo on the left, you can see uh, an example of a Kuching Girls School photograph from 1905 uh, that uh, it, it shows, you know, uh, it seems that um, this might be a multi-ethnic uh, class, actually, uh, based on the physiognomy, we're not sure. But what's interesting is that they are all also in a dress that is from the Malay world, but two of the girls are holding dolls in Western dress. So it's quite interesting to compare that with the kinds of dress that you see in the girls on the right, some of them wearing that, you know, the, 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 the doll, right? And sp still speaking of dress and um, just Malay girls in education, you have the examples here. So uh, by the time we get to our day and age, we have this as the non default mode of uh, school dress, right? Um, so that's interesting as well. But on the left, you see how uh, girls are simply... Um, depicted in this image 
as uh, they, they are flanking the photo of a colonial class um, with a white teacher on the desk, uh, but otherwise they're just there as uh, almost, you could say, as a decoration, which is quite strange, as opposed to the image on the right, which has an interesting uh, background story to it uh, that was related in the newspaper at the time in 1953 about the uh, brilliant educational career of a particular young Malay girl who uh, was able to skip two class levels uh, in her school at Stanford. Um, second topic would be this idea of the rustic habitus as a trope, um, and that's also quite um, uh, uh, a prevailing uh, uh, category of images in which Malays are depicted and often just labeled Malay, for example, uh, in, in settings uh, that, are rust, that are meant to depict their rustic habitus. And uh, very often, we, we just use them uh, as illustrations uh, unquestioningly without asking the socioeconomic uh, contexts behind such images. So for example, just as sampling, you hear, you, here you see this image of a Javanese haji uh, juxtaposed with uh, Malay houses at Tanjung Katong. And then I'm juxtaposing it yet again with another image of a Javanese haji's family. So maybe just very quickly because of lack of time. Uh, these are images not of some rural bucolic ideal, but these are plantations. The entire East Coast stretch of Singapore was a huge area, an area of um, almost continuous coconut commercial plantations, mostly run by Javanese and Bugis. So these were commercial agricultural speculators uh, who earned money from these plantations, commercial agriculture, and thereby funded all sorts of other activities, such as going for the Hajj. So how does that kind of understanding of the socioeconomic context of the photographs change the way we look at this instead of understanding it as some natural uh, Malay thing. Uh, the other thing is to talk about how these are uh, not studio portraits, but portraits are uh, in, in on location. Sometimes they become interesting sources uh, about things that are otherwise uh, not recorded. Uh, so in this case, for example, you have the uh, image of um, uh, a woman with her children in a hut, and it's just simply labeled uh, Malay woman and children in their kampung. But interestingly, it's taken by an RAF pilot uh, at Seleta Base. And based on the accompanying images uh, with this particular photograph, so if you see in its context, and if you look at the architecture, the kind of houses that were built, it's quite likely these might have been, no, perhaps the Orang Seleta, of which, for which very few images of their resettlement on land for a temporary period uh, uh, have survived. So we're not sure. So this is around Seleta Air Base, presumably. But looking at the houses, these are typically not Malay houses. Malay houses are not built in this manner. It's more likely uh, Orang Salita, but, but I'm not sure and I'm still trying to find out. But yeah, as you can see, they just labeled another Malay house, Malay houses and children. So the term Malay is used quite loosely. This particular one as well is quite interesting. If you look at it uh, from just um, the images, maybe you think, oh, you know, this is trying to emphasize backwardness of Malays. I'm not sure why people would say that. These are This family seems to be, I mean, looking at the house, it's quite well off. That's a very large, well-built wooden house. I don't know whether you can see that if you look at the image, they also have a pet bird uh, in a cage. Of course, obviously they are in their workaday clothes. Uh, it, um, so, so, you know, it, it looks a little bit, um, um, uh, let's say you wear it every day, what we call kain basahan in Malay, isn't it? The clothes you get wet in. Um, but um, if you look carefully at the, the family group as well, uh, and you look at them as individuals, uh, it's quite striking that uh, I don't think they are malnourished, for example. But also the interesting point that uh, child, uh, the person holding the children is actually one of the younger brothers rather than the mother or the daughter. So that also disrupts um, our gender expectations. The third example I want to talk about is looking at these images as um, examples of cosmopolitanism here through uh, Malay arts. So here's an example of an image uh, that is also quite uncommon of a, a Malay woman who is a musician and a, she's holding an accordion. It's just labeled Malay Girl Singapore. Looking at the house, it may well have been in, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, Kampung Kalang, one of the houses there, because there is a tradition of the Kalang Malays uh, being Bidwans and Bidwanda. So they they were both messengers. The word Bidwan is quite interesting. Again, no time to explain it fully, but it functioned both as messengers and as musicians, entertainers, and singers from the Sanskrit, actually, Vidu. But uh, anyway, so uh, this, this point here is that uh, it may this may well document the Kampung Kalang community. This image, again, just captioned Malay. Actually, 
if you take her in her context in this other image. So you've got to do some mixing and matching. This one is from MDA. This one is from University of Leiden Library. So they often are not in the same collection. I had to do the matching myself. So I discovered that if you took her in this image, then you realize it's part of this troupe. And true enough, when I look, looked at this image of the instrument, it's actually not the banjo, nor the gambus. It's neither. It's the instrument used for Wayang Parsi. And then when you see the image on the left, you realize it is the Wayang Parsi because of the, the other two persons accompanying her. So sometimes, you know, looking at these uh, other images might uh, allow us to look beyond, you know, uh, the selective uh, range. Other images would be uh, when it's labeled Malay Festival Dance, but it's actually a Javanese Wayang Topeng. Uh, Malay dance singles, when it's actually the um, uh, uh, dance drama of Javanese spongy tales and so on. So these are examples of earlier cosmopolitanisms. The fourth would be uh, the kinds of relabelings and reframings of studio portraits as postcards. So you have this remarkable example. Uh, it's actually of the Tengku Pumaisuri Che Ute Maria Binti Haji Sulaiman, second wife of Sultan Idris I of Pera. Now this um, the identity was provided by somebody who commented on the National Archives of Singapore photo. Otherwise, we, we, the Singapore archives would continue to just label this as Malay Lady of Royal Birth, for example, or um, Malay Lady of Noble Birth, or just uh, Malay Lady. You know? so, so it becomes um, just a generic image instead of an individual. So what happens when, that, um, when images get reproduced repeatedly or even redrawn? In the case on the left, it's actually a redrawing. The second example is this uh, of um, uh, Datin Salama Amba, uh, who is the wife uh, of Dato Jaffa bin Saleh, Chief Minister of Johor. So this uh, information um, it, and a permission to use this photo, uh, these other two photos accompanying her, stu uh, her port student portrait used as a postcard, uh, the permission was given by Zaina Anwar. Thank you very much. So these are actually from the private family uh, studio portraits, but again, they have entered the archives and circulated as just generically labeled Malay family. It's actually, this is actually the chief minister of Johor. Um, other images such as these also reuse as postcards. So uh, I have to move more quickly, but there's this also issue of the sitter self image. It's not just a generic image initially, but when it's reframed, you know what happens. Um, they could also be reframed when they are juxtaposed, new ways of juxtaposing studio portraits and then um, uh, scenes, urban scenes, landscapes, uh, photo photography. Now, again, a lot of questions are raised. They are of interest in and of themselves. Uh, for example, this is the harbour uh, of Arab Street, actually. This is the important Kampung Glam Harbour. It's labelled here Malay Craft Harbour, juxtaposed with a lady in a kurudung. Um, um, and then this image on the, on the right is um, an, a valuable one from 1951 of the Singapore Malay Women's Association are contributing a float to City Day celebrations in that year. Other examples of juxtapositions like this, where a Malay woman, again, you know, is just juxtaposed with urban scene, it's supposed to read into uh, such, um, you could say, curations of images. And in some cases, they also tell us about the um, sites of the Malay community in Singapore. So these are examples where we move, um, you know, we, we talk about looking at colonial era photography beyond the focus on the white male uh, colonizing gaze to see how, um, you know, you can see uh, candid photography uh, uh, having the subjects behave in ways that are unexpected because of the handheld camera, but also of certain uh, scenes that are otherwise uh, not usually uh, portrayed. So I would like to end with these two images and then close. So these uh, show urban uh, examples of the urban snapshots. Now, when we read them, you can see the questions in the, in the exhibition, right? When we read them, how do we, how do we interpret this? Also, we should turn the lens back on ourselves. How do we interpret these images of women uh, and their dress? Uh, do we say, oh, the woman on the left is modern, the woman on the right is traditional for some reason or another? Uh, are we to privilege a woman on a leisure trip with a handbag uh, posing elegantly on the overhead bridge over Collier Key, at that time a sign of modernity, with two women on their way to market? Or do we see it in a different way? So even our own interpretation, I'm very troubled by how we read into such images as well. Uh, do we see marketing as any less um, uh, important you know, as an activity? Uh, or do we see it as uh, women's management of household expenditure? Um, that, that sort of thing. You know, As much as we also value fashion as a way in which women... Uh, uh, 
exercise their financial um, decision making and independence and choice. So, so these kinds of things also how we read into kebaya modern as opposed to older forms of the kebaya. Uh, you know, I'm troubled by that. You know, how uh, recently there was a whole case that erupted about this um, because. The older kabaya itself was an older form of cosmopolitanism. That was kind of what I was trying to get at, at cosmopolitans older and newer. Um, other images of women um, uh, in urban snapshots around Singapore. Um, and I, in closing, you know, um, I just want to again ask, you know, in what ways uh, might um, images inadvertently or wittingly reveal an alternative, older or newer or alternative cosmopolitanism? And uh, including images that are not in the archives, perhaps if we can access them eventually. Uh, private family albums. Here's an example on the right of a community gift to the national. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, what what is the NSM? I forget suddenly, but it's one of the uh, National Museum of Singapore. It's NMS, sorry, not NSM. Um, this is actually um, at Johor Bahru, but it's um, uh, it, it's a gift from Rosaini Binti Haris, so one of the rare photographs. Uh, a late one though, uh, the date also is uncertain. It seems it's labeled 50 to 70, which is quite odd. Uh, there's a broad range. Uh, but anyway, I'm, uh, in closing, I would like to just say that perhaps it's possible you know, to think about um, colonial era photography in ways that uh, allow us to uh, think alternative means of accessing uh, photography as ways to understand uh, society in the Malay world uh, in the colonial era beyond uh, a focus on colonial agency alone uh, through heteroglossic readings. I hope uh, that presentation has been um, interesting for you. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Nuru. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Imran. That was a really engaging discussion. Um, I really liked, you know, the provocations on what does it mean to think about circulation and possession, right? You know, in relation to this um, archive of images. Um, just a reminder. For everybody in the audience, if you have any questions, you can post them in the Q&A and we'll get to that um, in the Q&A section later. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Surani Suratman, who is a social anthropologist, a senior lecturer and deputy head at the Department of Malay Studies and convener of the Minor and Gender Studies at the National University of Singapore. Her teaching covers areas on Malay studies, sorry, Malay culture and society, lived experiences of families and households, and art making in the Malay and Indonesian archipelago. Her research focuses on Malay ethnic identities and the reproduction of portrayals of Malays, gender relations and inequalities in Malay families and households, as well as politics of remembering. Dr. Suryani, please. Thank you very much, uh, Nurul, for that very generous introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for making time and staying on for this session. So let me then just uh, start uh, my presentation, uh, the title, Assembling an Imagined Everyday Life, Women's Work and Place. I'd like to uh, state first that um, I'm a first timer in engaging, yeah, as far as engaging with uh, photographs is uh, concerned. I had um, initial uneasiness with engaging or having to engage with photographs, not that they were not interesting, but it was more about how um, I, I would have to be speaking with photographs and not people's. It has been an interesting uh, learning uh, experience. Next slide, please. So uh, let me begin um, by adding on to uh, what you would have already uh, uh, known uh, or know and what um, the other researchers yeah, in this project have said about colonialism um, and experiences of colonial encounter. Um, from the question for me is, what had these encounters entailed uh, for colonial masters? And here I turn to Anne Stoller, who points out that colonial masters did not directly translate cultures yeah, from the European metropole to the colonies, and they had to create European uh, cultural configurations in specific colonial social order. So this new colonial social order, which you know, required governance um, and ways to administrate, called for new configurations of thinking and doing, in which, for example, uh, European food, dress, 
housing morality were given new political meanings. So for example, European households in Dutch East Indies copied the Javanese households uh, with regards to domestic servants, yeah, which provided European uh, women with plenty of uh, leisure time. So these were the practices of the uh, what you would call the Priyayi uh, class, the class of the princes and the uh, um, uh, regions. Next slide. Um, in this regard, I was very much also uh, uh, um, um, concerned, yeah, um, coming from where uh, what I've been uh, researching um, on, um, in 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 looking at what uh, colonial authorities um, thought, yeah, or what their notions were with regards to uh, women and and their roles. As far as um, um, women were con uh, were concerned, they were actually quite open yeah, to women or working. But as pointed out by Elspeth uh, Locher and Charlton, there were ambivalences of, uh, of the colonial authorities, for example, in the Dutch East Indies, with regards to the roles of, in particular, peasant Javanese women and their labor in the household. So on the one hand, they recognized women's roles in indigenous agriculture and their labor in colonial plantations. But there were also instances when there were a, um, there were a divide between European notions and, and indigenous uh, practices. One example here um, has to do with the bill on the regulation of, of night labor. So in 1925, when it was uh, being debated, uh, there were two uh, views. Um, there was one view that totally um, or wanted to totally ban um, night work yeah, for women and defended the interests yeah, of, uh, of the family. And so for this group of uh, um, of people, they were um, very insistent that women should be um, uh, in the uh, in the in the homes and should not be working at all. Then there was another view that was um, championed by those who were interested, yeah, of um, uh, interested in European agricultural uh, estates, yeah, those uh, estates that you know um, uh, oversee coffee plantation, for example. So here, uh, night labor was seen to be something um, perfectly natural uh, institution, um, and that the Javanese uh, peasant uh, norms, yeah, where women were allowed to work um, and and um, take on, yeah, night. Uh, um, labor um, deviated from uh, European uh, norms. Coming out from this discussion, the, com uh, the compromise yeah, that was made was that there is going to be restriction in hours um, and an obligation for European uh, estates to inform uh, government of the exceptions to the rule, uh, and that night labor um, for peasant women will remain um, intact. Yeah, so the view is that well, you know, they, you know, they, they need to be, uh, you know, uh, out there uh, working. Of course, in that, in in that sense, in that interest, yeah, in the interest of uh, the colonial masters. But women in um, uh, Priyayi uh, households were to have the socializing uh, tasks, yeah, of you know, of uh, ensuring uh, the, uh, the 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 role yeah, of women yeah, within within the house. Household. Next slide, please. Um, so coming back to, to, to uh, photographs, um, I, I'm um, very much uh, then therefore intrigued in looking at uh, you know how uh, these photographs yeah, um, contribute yeah, to uh, the, the, the creation of colonial authority uh, as well as history and how photographs were used yeah, to deal uh, with the unknown. And here, um, referring to um, Haidt and, and, and uh, Samson, they pointed out that you know, there was um, in this colonialist uh, photography, there was placement of co uh, colonized peoples as objects of fascination to help colonizers negotiate threatening experience of the unknown into more palatable uh, form. So, um, for example, peoples were depicted in um, so-called native yeah, environments to differentiate and highlight uh, social um, evolution. So, and um, also uh, colonial space yeah, were reframed as um, 
uh, as disorderly, as decadent, the kind that, you know, Dr. Imran was referring just now, you know, with regards to the uh, rustic uh, trope. Next slide. Now, given all the, uh, you know, uh, this, this, this background, I, I think uh, photographs have a, ve uh, have a vast a potential as a source of layers of um, uh, um, complex um, cultural information and, and uh, uh, knowledge. But there are, however, issues yeah, pertaining to this uh, potential. Uh, first, uh, the issue uh, has to do with how uh, photographs are powerful in creating uh, um, stories, but also in distorting identities and perpetuating ideas about culture. Again, you know, if you, you know, think uh, over what uh, Dr. Imran was uh, uh, saying just now in his presentation, um, the, uh, the kinds of uh, distortions yeah, uh, uh, can occur yeah, uh, in in, in um, and using in using uh, photographs, I think there needs to be um, also uh, you know this this um, recognition that you know photographs also is a site of power uh, relations. And what this means is that you know uh, you can have only one narrative, or there's a narrative that is more dominant, yeah, uh, than uh, than others. So um, given this uh, solutions, yeah, to, uh, you know, we need to find solutions therefore to try and work with this, uh, the potential of uh, photographs bearing in mind uh, these issues. Uh, next slide, please. So um, here I find Elizabeth uh, Edwards uh, quote uh, useful uh, for me, um, an important reminder that uh, photographs yeah, actually seldom have close meanings. We interpret and we give meanings to it, um, but it always, you know, it's it's not uh, it's not any uh, it's not uh, closed. Um, meaning that you know these uh, uh, the, the the meanings that are uh, attached are mutable and arbitrary, as you can see from uh, uh, from this uh, quote, and that a lot also depends yeah on the viewers, researchers uh, uh, in, uh, included. Um, and 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 then the context, yeah, of viewing, yeah, of uh, of viewing these uh, uh, photographs, um, and of course, very importantly, yeah, the you know the relationship with the written or the spoken uh, text, yeah, is important to uh, remember, and the embodied subjectivities of uh, of the viewer. Next slide, please. So coming from my research uh, interests on family lives and gender relations in households uh, in the Malay world, I was very keen to engage with photographs yeah, of women's um, work in and outside of the uh, of the household. So what I'm going to be, I'm going to be doing in this uh, next um, uh, section here is um, to share with you some of these photographs which um, I viewed. I initially did not look at the source description, um, the location, um, or the or, or the year. So as we go through these photographs together, bear in mind um, um, Heights and Samson's point about placement yeah, of colonized peoples as objects of uh, fascination. So this first slide, as you uh, can see, um, is the photograph, you know, uh, with a, a photograph of a woman with children, and there were many of such um, of such uh, uh, photographs in similar sorts of uh, settings, yeah, and um, what you, you know, then would think of, you know, this rustic, uh, uh, rustic uh, settings. Next slide. Um, also, uh, 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 photographs, yeah, and, and this is something that uh, uh, Dr. Imran had already shown, you know, women, um, you know, outside of the home holding, uh, holding this, you um, pottery uh, a pot. Um, so the objects yeah, around her becomes very uh, important to, uh, uh, to take note. Um, next slide, uh, please. Photographs, again, of women doing um, um, such daily activities like washing uh, clothes. And then I came also across, next slide, please, um, um, a collection yeah, of, of uh, photographs by um, a photographer of uh, Javanese descent, Cassian Seifers. Um, um, and these are studio studio uh, photographs, you know, uh, documenting uh, uh, documenting um, food preparation. So this is one of them, and there's a, a range yeah, of, of uh, such photographs. Uh, the next photograph uh, is one of um, women 
uh, a woman weaving a textile. So there were also um, many of such photographs, but not only confined to um, weaving of textiles. There were um, there were there were photographs of women weaving baskets, um, making uh, making um, pottery, and then of course also on you know, a painting, yeah, a, a wax on on um, on cloth to make a, a batik. Next slide. There were um, photographs uh, on of women at work here yeah, in the fields. And this, this is also a collection, you know, photographs of women in the paddy, um, uh, in, in, in the paddy uh, fields, um, carrying out, yeah, uh, carrying out the different, different uh, tasks, yeah, involved in, in, um, in paddy cultivation here, you know, planting seedlings. So there was a range of these photographs, you know, that take you through, yeah, that, uh, that process. Um, I found also photographs, next slide, of women in um, plantations, working in uh, um, coffee plantation, uh, in tobacco uh, plantations. Um, there's one later on, you'll see uh, this photograph of a woman in, um, in rubber uh, plantation. I was very much drawn to photographs of women in the markets. Next slide, please. And this came very, uh, you know, from my, my uh, past research and looking at women's income gem generating uh, projects yeah, in, in, in households. So, um, so uh, where then, you know, women are very much um, or play a very dominant role yeah, in such income generating uh, projects, whether it is uh, selling um, the products of what they have grown in their, uh, their own uh, gardens. Um, on next uh, next slide, please. Um, or as peddlers, right? Um, so so there was quite a lot of these uh, of these uh, um, uh, photographs uh, sh uh, showing women in the in the market uh, in the marketplace. The next slide is um, also an interesting for me. Um, uh, also, having um, uh, read a little about women in um, in in um, in their roles. Uh, sorry, not in their roles, but women as singers, yeah, and 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 dancers. Um, and and here, you know, you see um, uh, uh, um, women as part, yeah, of this um, of this entourage. And if you do a bit more reading, um, they were very um, much involved in. Uh, dance um, in drama groups um, as well as uh, storytelling. Next slide. So here for me, uh, what is uh, you know what is interesting is then of course the, the other observations can uh, uh, that we can make. Um, of course, uh, you can see you know um, the placement of women in that so-called native uh, environments um, that are very much intend to delineate yeah uh, uh, you know um, the native environment as opposed to the European civilized um, um, environments. Um, you would observe also the accompanying objects yeah, to showcase uh, these women in terms of what they are doing, like, you know, um, next to, you know, uh, um, uh, next to um, an object that, you know, ties with, with uh, the task yeah, of, uh, for example, uh, what you saw just now of um, washing clothes. Um, but what for me, was interesting, um, or the, the the two points that I find um, um, interesting, yeah, that can be observed is uh, first the range of activities that women did. Right, you could see that they were involved in so many uh, kinds of activities, and um, the other point is also uh, women's visibility in different spaces. Okay, so albeit in 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 a, a certain kind of uh, of placement in a certain of uh, uh, setting, um, they were not just you know um, confined to the households. They were they were also visible, say in the markets, yeah, and and in the uh, uh, in the streets and in, uh, in the city. Next slide, please. In her presentation um, two weeks ago, Dr. Masna proposed alternative ways of seeing and gave uh, two methods to disrupt and uh, disturb. Um, she pointed out you know, uh, um, one, one way is you know, 
to um, to invert, yeah, to invert the colonial and camera gaze. Um, and and the, the second the second uh, method was to uh, use the comparative uh, device. It means you place two uh, contrasting images you know, together such that they are having um, a dialogue. How else can we disrupt and disturb? And if I may add, dispute here yeah, ways of uh, seeing. So for me here, the assembling yeah, um, uh, of a, a collection yeah, of photographs um, is, is um, uh, also a way, yeah, uh, a way to disrupt, disturb, uh, and dispute. Um, assembling a collection of photographs creates a new um, creates new relationships yeah, between photographs and viewers with the photographs. It also allows varying ways to re-engage with the images as a collection. As I hope you know you, you would have gathered in those um, the previous yeah, sets of um, sets of uh, photographs. In the following assembly of photographs, I've also included a description from uh, the source. Um, next slide, please. Um, and 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 you know, it's, it's, uh, I like you to also uh, take note yeah, of this uh, description um, from uh, from the source. So this um, assembly yeah, of photographs yeah, is is pertaining again to my research interest on on, on women's um, labor. Um, uh, here, the the, uh, the 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 title or the description is "Batik Women in a Yard." Um, the placement of these women in the yard of their homes in a way reproduces also a domesticated uh, women who are still, yeah, uh, you know, um, or it can yeah, reproduce uh, this notion of domestic, uh, domesticated uh, women um, who do their work, you know, with, uh, within uh, the um, context of their uh, household. Next slide. Okay, so... The description again of this photograph yeah, is a woman suckling child in a boat, possibly in Surabaya. Um, of course, you know, I mean, there are many ways, of, uh, you know, to dis to dispute, yeah, the, the you know the description, and I, you know, very often also rely on Dr. Imran because he's too much that you know he you know he can he he, uh, he he knows yeah for example okay um you, you can question whether this is actually in Surabaya by just looking at the type of hat yeah that the the, the woman is is um uh, is uh, uh, wearing but for me this description yeah uh, that you know of, of of women suckling child in a boat um, um silences actually women interspersing yeah whatever they do with their care responsibilities yes they are suckling um uh, a, a, a child um, in 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 today's context, actually, we could say, yeah, this woman is juggling work and 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 family, or another phrase would be managing work life uh, 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 balance. So in that regard, there are questions that we can uh, we can uh, raise, and the questions that I would you know like to know is, well, where is this woman going on the boat? Yeah, what are those items that you find yeah in 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 the in the boat? So texts are important, yeah, because because the kind of text here yeah, that you see yeah, in, in describing the photographs removes this woman actually from her context. Yeah? And I saw that note that, you know, it can't be Surabaya, it would be in the uh, uh, Sulu. Thank you. Next. So again, with regards to um, uh, uh, women's labor, having to care for children, I think, did not hinder yeah, women from Econ um, uh, economic activities. They intermingle here, yeah, uh, you know, um, um, these activities, the care activities, as well as economic, as you would have seen, I hope, and from the two previous photographs. Um, so this photograph, um, um, for example, is for me interesting because it could also be indicative of women and men sharing uh, responsibilities. Um, the uh, prevalence of you know both or the presence of uh, you know of also uh, the child also you know says a lot you know can say a lot about you know sharing uh, responsibilities we can you know um, um, I, I I can't I don't have time to elaborate on it but you know we can you know if you're interested I can I can elaborate on this later um, next slide so another 
set yeah, that I've assembled together is uh, again coming from my interest in women in, um, in um, work, uh, this time in employed uh, uh, work. So this is um, um, the image here and uh, you can see uh, uh, women in a rubber plantation and you know from the description you know state uh, uh, states that um, um, that women were very much involved yeah in um, employed work they were you know they were um, um, uh, very prepared yeah to to do, uh, to take on this this uh, this this um, employed work um and and the underlining yeah the underlining for me you know reason you know had to do with contribution yeah contribution to the uh, household income um, women were also employed in non-agricultural activities, as you will see in this uh, next slide. Um, and it is an image of um, women in, um, a teen, um, in a teen mine. Okay, now we've come to the last uh, uh, um, image here. And this is um, an image um, with uh, showing um, uh, my see with AMA. So domestic service was an essential feature yeah, of colonial uh, culture in both British uh, Malaya and uh, Netherlands uh, Indies. Um, women servants were especially hired yeah, to care uh, for the children. Again, you know, this is, uh, it's also very um, interesting to look yeah, at this, you know, this uh, kind of uh, relationship yeah, that uh, comes out yeah, from um, the, the presence yeah, of, um, of the amas or you know, uh, domestic servants in, yeah, in a European uh, household. Um, what I find interesting, and this is uh, from the study of Rosha Scholten, uh, is how, uh, and from her study where she showed, yeah, um, you know, um, um, a table yeah, um, from, uh, that she extracted you know, from the census that was done in the 1930s, uh, she found that domestic service was one of the less popular employment for work after agriculture, agricultural work, small industry employment, and small uh, trading. So, uh, you know, the, the, uh, in a way, there, there was a range yeah, of possibilities in the sense of uh, for women yeah, to, uh, to, uh, to seek um, uh, employed um, work uh, and, and thereby yeah, contribute uh, to the household income. Next slide, please. So this, for me, um, going back yeah, to this attempt to disrupt, disturb, and, 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 and um, um, dispute, there's quite a bit of introspection and inspection on my part as, um, as, uh, as a researcher. So this different uh, assembly of photographs therefore tells us yeah, different uh, stories. By putting a set yeah, or an assembly of photographs, they can tell us different uh, uh, stories. Um, and I think it is also important yeah, from these um, uh, uh, assembly of photographs in that um, it opens up yeah, spaces uh, to give presence yeah, to absent, what I call um, um, otherwise absent uh, narratives. Um, so it is, it is not only, I think, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the research, researcher or me as a researcher viewing uh, these photographs and, you know, being able to put, yeah, to put uh, a set of photographs together, I think, you know, um, Everyone, yeah, can have that, you know, that 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 um, avenue, yeah, to do it in whichever, you know, uh, uh, possibilities that you have. Our online exhibition, for example, has the option for you to put together photographs uh, for your own exhibition. So, in 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 um, in. Uh, given this opportunity, I hope yeah that uh, you know um, there will be lots of you who will uh, assemble yeah some photographs yeah to disrupt, disturb, and uh, uh, dispute. I think um, the, uh, the, 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 there's a lot of, you know, uh, um, this need yeah, for multiple uh, narratives and, you know, um, in, in order, yeah, in order to, yeah, uh, in a way, uh, as I said, to, you know, to, uh, to disrupt, dispute, and, um, sorry, disrupt, disturb, and dispute, yeah, existing uh, narratives. So, um, with that, let me end with this last uh, uh, slide, and I would like to actually uh, conclude yeah, uh, with a reflection that um, I have 
um, you know, which we can think about yeah, together beyond you know, this exhibition being and, and, and becoming. I mean, the, broader, uh, the broader area that you know, I've, um, uh, you know, I've, that have come out yeah, from, for me, yeah, from, from doing or being part of this project is in terms of museums, practices of collecting, curating and, and um, collaborating. And I think this is you know, also clear yeah, in Dr. Imran's uh, presentation in terms of how, yeah, how we put together, yeah, uh, put together uh, photographs uh, becomes important and you know, how we curate them. And this is um, uh, looking at museums practices, you know, something that we uh, you know, can reflect uh, upon. For me, especially personally, yeah, um, it's about the approaches, yeah, that are used by museums to categorize and to uh, to describe. Here, yeah? um, I don't, um, I'm not speaking for the, the 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 rest of the the researchers, but I, you know, I'm guessing that, yeah, I know they would also, you know, share uh, in 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 that in their experiences, in 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 their encounters of how, yeah, photographs, yeah, are being categorized. Um, uh, and how then these the, the descriptions and the text yeah um, um, that accompany these photographs become something that you know we need to uh, uh, you know think uh, about to um, introspect and to uh, inspect here yeah, uh, these texts. So with that, I'd like to thank you for um, staying on for this session, and I'd like to pass the session over back to Nurul. Nurul, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Suryani. That was so engaging, and I'm actually really excited um, to begin our Q&A. Can I invite Dr. Imran and Dr. Suryani back for our Q&A session? All right, so I would just like to share with the audience that if you have any questions or comments, you can type them into the Q&A box, um, and we will fill them accordingly. So um, before I start, I just wanted to also like share, I think, Dr. Suryani, um, I really resonated with what you said, you know, the, um, having to kind of, for the lack of a better word, encounter images, especially archival images, um, can often be quite uncomfortable. And, you know, like having to interpret or in a sense that read or speak for, you know, especially the women in the images um, becomes a way to, for, for us to kind of think about how do we then um, approach or how do we then, um, in a sense, create a certain sense of familiarity, right? Mm. With, Images. So I think as a start, I wanted to ask um, both you and uh, Dr. Imran, I think I realized that both of you engage in um, different approaches, but nonetheless, both um, acting as sort of troublemakers, you know, they <laughs> relate to the archives, you know, um, Imran, you uh, mentioning that you are mixing and matching and, you know, um, interrogating the, the text and Dr. Sirani, you mentioning about what does it mean to the 3Ds, right? To disrupt, to disturb, and to dispute. So I think as a start, I just wanted to pose the question, um, how do you, I mean, in your respective roles as researchers, but also, you know, as, as your own persons in your positionality um, as, as whatever, like as women, as, as Malay, or however, you know, you recognize, um, how did you go about uh, navigating um, the ways of identifying, recognizing, locating, um, and interpreting um, the images that you're encountering? I know it's a big question, but I think it will just be nice to hear um, what has been your personal um, encounter with these images that has brought you mm -hmm. to the approaches that you're taking. Wow, how do we start? Um, Dr. Sirani, I'll, 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 I'm only starting first to give you some time to breathe after the presentation I, thank you, you know, thank you I, question thank you i thought and, imran you know it was because you want to do the troublemaking first <laughs> <laughs> um maybe let's start with that then this idea of troublemaking in, yeah. in quote unquote i mean it's it's not um malicious it's uh rather just i think everybody is in this enterprise today of reinterpret uh, of rethinking how we approach colonial era image making um and I think I'll start with the most sensitive and difficult. Uh, museums inherited a number of labels. Very often our museums dis have a disclaimer. They say this is the, what is the exact phrasing? Something like um, they have not amended the original um, label, right? So they retain the label. So there isn't yet labor put in to rethink how these images are presented to the general public. Although I, when I say general public, very few 
members of the general public go in to look at the images. So that's one. Just the basic act of how they're labeled. We inherited labels that we unproblematically uh, reproduce with a caveat, with a disclaimer, but then I think we need to do more. That's number one. Um, you know, number number two, I was, I mean, from my position, uh, personal position now to directly, more directly answered uh, Nuro's actual question. Um, I actually didn't have the time to give the fuller preamble that Dr. Suryani gave, that I'm also uh, approaching this uh, a bit more cautiously because my own, uh, let's say, as a researcher first, and then as somebody who looks at it as an individual, as a researcher first, my own uh, use of visual uh, archives is mostly to look at uh, physical settings, not mm. people, right? So this is my first disclaimer. I'm not an anthropologist, unlike Dr. Suryani. I come from... Um, at, at, at most, I would say the closest it gets is visual culture or material culture, but it's actually more um, urban settings, architecture, place, um, yeah, uh, built environments, you can put it that way. Uh, so I thought that um, one of the ways in which uh, we could reframe and re de decenter the imperial gaze, if you like, is to understand exactly what is being photographed, where, uh, and um, just by asking these basic questions. So just now, just a clarification, there was Sulu, not Surabaya. I think I managed to message you. Sulu, for example, just knowing you know that this is rather than a generic label. So and also as a as a historian of um, I mean I, I I'm interested in the histories of uh, um, culture more generally uh, in, in the Malay world. So some of these images actually are accessed differently by different people. So now coming to a more personal level, I'm interested in, for example, the circulations of uh, cultural practices and performances in the Malay world from the early modern period. From the 14th, 15th centuries, the earliest we get references for uh, Hika Raja Raja Pasai, for example, they give us anecdotes about the circulation of certain forms. So then we can also read into these. That's why I put the, the term heteroglossic, mm. because there uh, it means that there are different ways in which we can completely decenter the, the imperial gaze. It's important, we must acknowledge it at the outset, but I do not wish to continually center or foreground the imperial, the problem with the imperial gaze. Because I feel that then how do we move away? Tirani and I have tried to move beyond that in, in our own ways, you know. So otherwise our discourse is stuck at just saying how problematic the imperial gaze is. It, we're just stuck there forever. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we need to move to, to somehow, you know, uh, so this is me personally speaking. Uh, each of us have our own interests. So coming back to what Dr. Sirani ended the presentation with, each of us have our interests. And it, it's our, our, in a way, it's our, our personal encounters, right? And our own ways of, um, our own agency in looking at these images of French. Uh, well, they are colonial era images with all its attendant problems. There are yet, as yet, heteroglossic other ways of counter-othering uh, in looking at these images. So that's my personal interest and I tried to foreground some of that. I hope that kind of answers, uh, you know, both the as a researcher as a, and then as a personal, as, and everybody personally, how they encounter the images, mm. how they might try to push beyond. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so um, following uh, that, I mean, I think, you know, I'd like to go back again to that um, quote that I, uh, I showed from... Um, Elizabeth uh, Edwards, yeah, that that points out also this um, point uh, points out uh, that um, we all are, you know, uh, embodied, you know, with our subjectivities, and you know whether you know as a researcher or you know as as um, you know personally as a uh, as a viewer, and um, um, so so I I I I'm coming from actually from. That that standpoint where you know sometimes it's very difficult yeah to to draw the line between a researcher and and um and and um you know uh, and a viewer right in this case or somebody who's just looking and it um but um, um uh, of course you have to try yeah as a, as a researcher but whatever it is I think you know for for me as a researcher as an an, an individual I think there's something that you know um brings this together and that is about um questioning singular narratives yeah mm -hmm. statements right i mean 
as an individual, you know, and as a researcher, I find it so difficult that you only can, you know, have one way of looking at things and, you know, and 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 um, doing uh, doing things. So, so I think, you know, that's where I was I was coming from. Of course, you know, um, in my in in that you know initial encounter, it it I. Uh, I bring along what I've uh, I've read and done and research on, and that was useful. It was useful to, um, you know, to you know look out, yeah, look out for things. But I think that openness, yeah, becomes very important because if you you you, you don't, you know, don't, then you again, you know, if, uh, you, I I feel that you know as a researcher, then you tend to then just you know take that, um, you know, uh, you know same. Uh, uh, approach and all that. So I mean, I think researchers can be also quite ideological. Yeah, in the way that you know we want to do our 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 research. I hope that 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 addresses yeah um your yeah. Your, your question. <clears throat> no, thank you. I think um I wanted to kind of begin also with this question because a lot of the times when we encounter the colonial archive, we are met with the colonial narrative. You know, yeah. so then what does it mean for us to then intervene and interpret? And I think, you know, the, the interesting thing about this exhibition is, that, you know, 50 images looking at the Malay wall. So I think, you know, in that sense, the colonial narrative through this archival images has given us their interpretation or their documentation of the Malay wall. But in, in each of your presentations, you are also kind of invoking new methods of looking at the Malay wall. I think um, Dr. Imran mentioned about um, looking at environments and looking at habitats and how it brings about, you know, ideas of new and old cosmopolitans. Uh, cosmopolitanism, you know, and and how do we, how can we then read through that? And I think Dr. Sirani, you also mentioned about the importance of women's labor, um, and not just through the uh, uh, agricultural plantations of, of the colonial, but also within the domestic, within um, the different other spaces. So I want there there are come kind of questions coming up. Um, let me first read them. Um, so um, Vivian Wee has a question for both um, you and both of you. So would you like to comment on the class relationship between the photographer and the people being photographed? In one case, the photographer owning a camera is dominant. In another case, the people who are being photographed are paying the photographer or the photo studio to photograph themselves. Um, any one of you would like to take this? Mm. Look, Sirani, would you like? I, I'd uh, like to go first. No, no, please uh, uh, go ahead. I'm just reading again, uh, Vivian's. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I also yeah. would like some time to because I just realized. Oh, that's the chat. I didn't open it. So thank you, Vivian. <laughs> I think both of us know Vivian, of, of course. So yeah. Hi, hi, Vivian. Uh, it's good to hear from you. Uh, too bad I can see you. It's it's good to hear your question. It's a very interesting one, and unfortunately, because of lack of time, I had actually some slides on the photographers. They have some rare few photographs of photographers themselves in the colonial setting. I thought, you know, I better not stray too much into all sorts of other things. But you're absolutely right. And this is one of the, the things that I am still struggling with. How, how to articulate, you know, a, 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 think, a rethink about um, that, that colonial era photographs are not all about the dominance of uh, imperialist, uh, let's say, I don't know, gays. Because quite a number of these are by commercial photographer, commissioned by the people we call the colonized themselves in photographic studio settings. So, how are we to read them as colonial photography or just colonial era photography? So I spoke of a few that were private studio portraits commissioned for family use, right? That were then circulated in colonial era postcards. So they have trans, 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 been transferred, right? From one domain to the other. From one where the indigenous have their own agency in commercial studios uh, to one that, that, that had recast. But your question is a bit different. So you're asking, you know, um, photographer own, owning a camera is the dominant party and then the subject is either paying for it or are just, you know, candidly being photographed without, sometimes without their permission, obviously. I, I, I don't think, very rarely do they actually ask, hi, can I take you a photograph of you as you're walking? I, I don't think so. So you're absolutely right. This is um, class relationship. I'm not sure. It, it Maybe it might not be a class relationship sometimes. It's just the question of, um, you know, the, the, the uh, you know how it is when we, how do we want ourselves to be portrayed? Uh, how do we read then the, the images being produced? Because sometimes you, especially when the image is moving, when you are captured, let's say I'm talking right now and one of you do a screen, still shot of me talking. You might catch me in a position where my mouth is like this. Or, you know, so, so 
then we read the still of the, the living person forever. And we interpret the person's expression like that forever, as though that was the truth. But, um, you know, there's, uh, there's this question of, for me, beyond what you're saying, class, but also the problem of interpretation. Because we are opening the invitation for all of us to freely interpret or reinterpret. But sometimes I wonder, like you're taking your selfie. You're troubled by the first image. I don't like. You take again, second, third. Just imagine that. So if you have that kind of empathy and you look at the urban candid photography, please bear that in mind as you go on your willy-nilly, freely interpreting, you know, what you think the person is feeling that day based on the facial expression. Maybe you could be entirely wrong. It's just that particular still image. So there's, therein lies the danger of our misinterpretation of candid photography in the urban setting. What more with the fact that there is no, uh, obviously no permission uh, asked, yeah. uh, sought in the first place and so on. I don't know whether that really answers the question. As opposed to photo studios, there, there is a paid position. So that's very different. So I yeah. thought, uh, you know, that's one of the things I was troubled by. I didn't have time to fully articulate it. But yeah, the citrus image, there's this wonderful um, article by John Clark that I didn't have time to also discuss. You know, this whole thing about, um, but he was looking at Mon King Monkut and uh, Raden Saleh, you know, they are commissioned portraits. So that's entirely different. But but hmm. those are people in high positions of power. But I think we are also talking about the um, more general public in the colonial era who went for studio photography. So their images being circulated as postcards raises a whole series of questions. I have yet to um, really compile all the sources about the problems attending to this, permissions or whether there was a, you know, kind of a clause when you went to a photo studio that they had the right to circulate your image. I don't mm. know. So mm. these are quite uh, interesting questions to ask. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I've got nothing to add um, uh, on yeah, to what uh, Dr. Iran has, has said, you know, because there are so many, the contexts are really, you know, uh, as he pointed out, yeah, the, uh, you know, um, um, are many and so it's 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 not just about uh, class and then you know uh, I think you know um, we can think it's not that you know we shouldn't uh, we uh, we shouldn't think about you know these class relations but I think there are other yeah other aspects that we need to also uh, consider as 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 Dr Imran pointed out. Thanks, Vivian. Thank you, Vivian, for the question. Um, there is another question here. Um, and this pertains to the collections. I think, you know, talking about how museums inherit labels and how they then um, collect and categorize. So there's a question here. Um, is there a form of, of family literature or family archives that are impactful in understanding the colonial and post-colonial experience? I noticed that there are families who are in possession of such materials from photos, journals, how do we close the gap between official academic work and family stories um, and collection? By Ruby, you saw. Um, Imran, would you like to? Yeah, I think it, yeah. Imran, yeah. <laughs> I know, and I'm still interpreting the question as well. Uh, I noticed <laughs> that there are families who are in, yes. How yeah. do we close the gap between official academic work and family stories collection? Ah, okay, maybe that's the question, right? How do we close the Okay, what's the gap to begin with? Um, I suppose, uh, you know, this this kind of, uh, the gap here we're talking about is perhaps um, that for families, there's a different value place, right, on the, the images being produced uh, that are private to the family and they have significance within the family setting. But then as, um, let's say, researchers uh, or outsiders even, not just researchers, but outsiders looking at these photos, we tend to then have a different set of what we value uh, a different dimensions of the photograph that we value. Oh, for its historical, uh, for as a historical record of an era of dress, of so on, as opposed to when the family talks about how this is your great grand maternal grand aunt or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I I think that's where you're talking about. And are, is there a form of family literature or family archives that are impactful in understanding the colonial and post-colonial experience? I don't know. That's a different question. Yeah. I suppose that has not been properly done in the Malay world, if I may safely say that, I see that photographs, I think I mentioned this very quickly earlier, these photographs tend to be used just as illustration, for illustration purposes. Mm -hmm. The main narrative of text of books where they appear in, publications they appear in, do not address what the photographs are about usually. It's just, the caption might just say who they are and then no further comment. So there is this, I think it's safe to say, uh, there's also a very wonderful publication recently by MDA, if I'm not mistaken, 10 postcards. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but there was, 10, something like, uh, or is it 50 images of the of Malay, Malaya, something like that. 
Uh, and then there was some, um, but but it, that has not pushed the frontier uh, very much because it was a bit, um, it tried to make it a bit more reader friendly. It didn't go uh, very deep into the analysis of each and every image. So I think that this kind of uh, research, I suppose, is not very well developed for Malay world colonial era photography, or let's just restrict it to Malaya, Singapore, colonial era photography yet. There are volumes and volumes of nostalgic photo images, you know, published since the year 2000 or so, or even 1980s, but they do not critically comment on these images. Oh. I, I think most of us know these, they, 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 they republish photographs from the archives and postcards, but no critical commentary. It's just, you know, by the way, if you wanted to see what images were like this, these are Malays, look, so, mm. and then these are Chinese, you know. And then these are people doing this. So there's no further analysis. I don't know. What, and that includes, like I said, the family portraits from the family or from, from uh, Johor's chief minister, the ones I reproduced. Uh, they, I first encountered them in a book by Gretchen Liu showcasing the images from the archives. There was no comment. It was just Malays. And then, you know, I think it's just to illustrate that Malays took photographs in the era. That's it. Mm. So not yet. There is not yet. Uh, because she... Gretchen knew when she did it. I don't know how she got the special permission. I don't know how many hundreds of photographs were in that collection. Mm. So it was more about just showcasing how many there are, the variety, but not actually, um, you know, kind of talking about what these images could tell us about uh, either private studio photography, family life, class, whatever. No. Yeah, uh, you know, I think there are there are um, also uh, attempts. You're right, Imran. I mean, I haven't seen also, you know, within the context of say um, Malaysia, Singapore, right? Uh, uh, this this attempt of. Um, bringing together yeah, um, collections of family photographs and then those also of, you know, of um, photographs that have been put together by academics and, and, and you know, res uh, researchers, curators and so on. But I, I've um, come across you know, the, the work of Elizabeth uh, Edwards yeah, and that's looking at photographs in, um, in Australia um, with regards to the, the first peoples, you know, where it's bringing together, yeah, bringing together um, um, uh, photographs yeah that some some that were locked in the archives and out yeah and bringing it uh you know uh to to um to the um peoples um and also for them to bring these photographs yeah and to engage uh, you know to engage with these uh, photographs and then to tell yeah that uh, stories or give a narrative of you know um you know uh, their 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 um, relation, yeah, their relation to um, whatever the images uh, the images are. I think that you know that kind of um, uh, you know uh, um, work, yeah, has been done uh, has has been done elsewhere. I think those these are also important points, right? In the sense that when we think about family collections, they they might not necessarily see it as an archive. You know, for them, it yeah. is a familial collection, a yeah. connected family. And I think this is also um, then then in thinking about how how we then read them, which is why I think I um I really appreciated Dr. Strani when you were showing the images of the women um undergoing labor, and they was also wearing like the kabaya or the bajikurung, which now we only see as fashion, you know, as kind of the ornamentalization. So I think that also becomes um, an important way of thinking about how do we you know uh, interpret and, and, and what is that level of encounter mm. um, there is another question here um, based on the number of photographs you have seen how often it, is it that the subjects of these photographs are able to present themselves and or their surroundings in ways they would like how they choose to pose, dress, smile, furnish the settings. What kinds of photos are these? Are these family group shots, occupation, costume, dress, etc.? The photographs. Uh, sorry, Imran. Um, I, I just sort of like the thanks. Uh, so the photographs that you know that I um I and I encountered that was you know of course a range you know a range of um of photographs as you could see I mean in different settings, um studios and non non uh studios. Um, there's that one photograph of the paddler. Um, that to me is you know is um my uh, the. Um, top on my list, yeah, uh, my favorite, yeah, my favorite list where uh, it's a collection um, from the National Geographic uh, Society, and so it's these are you know like can you know those can kind of uh, of shorts, right? So um, there was some where I did you know then wonder wonder you know like okay you know even in 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 the context of that you know in in the 
household yeah and or uh, washing uh, washing the uh, washing the uh, washing uh, clothes and so on whether it was uh, something that was um how do you call it performed here yeah, for 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 the camera and and the person taking the the the, the photograph i mean i didn't you know like um pay attention um, very closely to to this and I, I mean it's something that you know I need to uh, uh, look at um, because I was you know as I said I was very just intent on on the the um, the theme yeah that I I, I was uh, you know I was uh, engaging with and and its activity and it's just just so many <laughs> uh, too many yeah too many of it and where there were other kinds of questions that you know was um um that i prioritized so i wouldn't you know i i it seems like they were you know they were you know could be right uh, could be performing yeah or presenting uh, themselves but there were others you know where it's not so clear you know so clear for me mm. okay, a quick one i guess sorry oh uh, maybe just a quick one i think uh just directly answering the question itself, how uh, how often is it that they are able to present themselves in what how they like and so on? Uh, it seems, and I, I I think I raised this before. Very few are from uh, elite Malay families who take photos in studios. Uh, most of the photos in studios that we get in the archives, I'm talking about archives, I'm not in family private collections, are Chinese and Chinese Pranakan. So this again reinforces a certain bias uh, in the kinds of images that we see circulating. Uh, you know, the, in representing the colonial era as well. Yeah. So I I, I mentioned earlier that uh, the newspapers in the seven uh 80s actually uh kept uh, you know imploring them. Uh, there were a series of eight or nine articles in Britta Harian saying that you know they didn't get enough. They they've been asking an open call. Nobody is submitting anything. I know that they exist. They exist. There are elite Malay families, mostly Javanese actually. Javanese Malay. Ja Malays of Javanese descent, like Dr. Suryani himself, you know. So the Javanese, they a lot of them, they don't, they don't submit. So uh, you know, uh, maybe I'm I'm veering from the question, but I'm saying that there is a uh, uh, lack of representation in that sense. Yeah. So that is an area of concern for me, actually. Yeah. And I think that also um, begs the question of um, what is archivable, right? Or like what is you know what is then um, available for access and archiving and then and after that what is being done uh, to it you know so um, I think there's a question here that also relates by uh, Chabib Duta interested in the idea that native people being photographed in non-candid way red staging despite some rich people also being photographed that way. So I'm thinking about what you're talking about the, the rich Pranakan Chinese images Imran. Can we also think uh, we need to dispute in reading or interpreting it, since I see it implies uh, power relations. So like Dr. Suryani said, and how we can dispute um, the simplified caption, which silence women's activities. Mm. Um, Imran, did you want to uh, say anything Actually, I'm to trying that? to understand the question. Yeah. I think I understand the point, but I'm trying to understand the question. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. I mean if I can interpret the question, um, is I think it's 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 sort of also kind of an extension to the comment uh, in the approach of talking about interpreting and reading, yeah. right? Um, and I think you know with this whole class, the distinction with with class, um, and and how do we then um, read it across the different class status, perhaps? And I think um, I think for me it's the last part, um, yeah. the simplified caption which silence women activities, yeah. and how then um, interpret the silence or how do we then you know evoke a voice um, from that the silent image in itself yeah I mean I think um, yeah it's yeah it's about the text you know and and how we read the text and also knowing that um, as I said I mean like you know because it's uh, um, this text that you know uh, comes alongside with the uh, with the photographs yeah if you don't um, question it right it, it gets circulated in a way and we think that okay coming from a, a collection of works yeah this uh this this is it so the reading becomes you know the reading of that text becomes important um and then the interpreting of uh, from of, of that text yeah is also is also very very important so in order to to dispute it then um it is it is a lot of work as i said you know of inspecting right inspecting that text and of course you you have to have that knowledge 
background where, you know, for example, Dr. Imran was, you know, can easily then say, no, that's not Surabaya. It's Sulu, right? I would have to do the next step of researching and finding out. But I think that's a very important uh, aspect. And if I may, I mean, this is what uh, I, I feel um, uh, um, needs to, uh, you know, um, something that needs to continue, right? In terms of museums collecting and, and how, you know, and, and collaborating, you know, collaborating with um, people, you know, like Dr. Mran, for example, who has that, you know, that background or any other researchers that can um, add on, yeah, add on to, uh, to the text um, um, and description, yeah, description of the, uh, of the photographs. Because once it's there, right, and then it circulates to the next person and, you know, it, it's, 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 it's written there black and white and we think that, oh, yeah, okay, that must be it. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's why like the position everyone's positionality is so important because then yeah. we don't just merely adopt that colonial frame or that colonial lens when we're reading, but we're trying to evoke a new right. perspective or new approaches of doing so. Um Imran, do you have anything to add? No, just ask the basic, just ask basic questions about what is actually being photographed. Look at the caption, yeah, sure. They might supply some information, but very often, like I said, many of the images that say Malay or Malay house or Malay family. Nothing else. As, as a person trained in visual culture, and, and, and you know, so if you're, even if you're not, you can still ask basic questions about what is actually being shown. We have all gone through in primary school, you know, what was it called? What? Visual comprehension. You're given a picture, please describe the photograph. Well, go through that. Somebody like the brilliant uh, art, his, art historian and art critic, TK Sabapati, he would ask you to, come on, look at the image, you know, tell me more. What do you see? Something like that. We, we just need to look at the image properly and ask and address these questions. If we cannot answer them, that's okay. Leave it as a troubling uncertainty. Don't say, oh, I don't know. I'm going to foreclose this. No, never foreclose anything. Yeah. And I think that's what's so interesting about um, this whole exhibition and project, right? Like even though it's about images of the Malay world, we also start to unpack what is what does Malay encompass, you know, like mm. what has been attributed or inherited, but and then what needs to be challenged. Um, so... We're going to just finish the question. So I'll take like another 10, five to 10 minutes. Um, there's a question specifically for Dr. Imran. Um, they said that I noted that one of your slides contrasted how the landscape was represented differently in colonial era texts versus photographs. How do we think about the multimodality of colonial era epistemologies and ideologies? Do textual and visual tropes generally supplement or complement each other? Or are there also interesting points of tension and contradiction when we compare contemporaneous textual and visual representations? Big questions. Yeah, interesting questions. And I'm not a morning person, so my brain is still kind of like slowly starting up. <laughs> so uh, please let me uh, give, give me a bit. I have, okay, so uh, how the landscape was represented in text versus photograph. Oh yeah, actually that's a very brilliant question. Um, that's the thing. So I, I don't know whether it came through clearly, but I, in my presentation, I tried to state this as one of the ultimate, I, I called it the ultimate, one of the ultimate questions at the beginning. Remember there was that long wordy slide. And I said, ultimately, you know, I'm kind of trying to ask uh, myself, uh, is it, is, uh, uh, you know, is colonial era photography redeemable as a source? Basically, it's just a basic question like that, you know, is it redeemable as a source, an alternate texts, for example? Uh, you know, a picture can speak a thousand words. So sometimes you just have a simple record about a particular phenomenon, a place, or people in, in textual form. I mean, when I say when we say account, it's always textual. Now, how about if we had a visual record? Mm. How does it change things? Yeah, that's a very fundamental question. Mm. Um, and, uh, but, but, but we have to be aware that um, many of these photographs are taken as a form of colonial record. So then they come, they inherently, you know, there are biases. Uh, uh, that's where we try to find um, photography by, uh, this is very rare, but they, they, they are out there. Maybe we need to do a second call uh, by elite Malay uh, families who had their own photo, uh, ca early cameras, the oldest cameras there were, there were quite a number of Malays who had such. I know of one such person living in Kampung Kalang. He's of Banjar descent. He's passed away, of course, but uh, 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 the father of the person. And, and he took photographs in 1927 to 1929. That's quite rare. 
for Malay. Malay is recording their own settlement. Mm. You know, such images are extremely precious. So I don't know whether that answers the question. Uh, that visual record and visual representation, who is doing the recording? Who is who is behind the camera matters? And there are not enough of images. So I'm trying to say that colonial era photography need not only be from the colonials, a uh, colonial uh, administration. Mm. It might be privately taken photographs by Malays themselves. It's just that we don't have them in the archive. Doesn't mean they don't exist. So that's that's some I guess at the frontier because we don't have them in the archive yet. Yeah, I think everybody knows about um, our first president Yusuf Hisab being a photography buff, but that's quite late. Anyway, uh, I've kind of gone off, and, but I, I think you know what I mean. So you know, and that's already not so much colonial era because it was fifty nine and and then uh, the fifties is kind of like the cusp. But I'm saying earlier eras. You know, it, we might have to try and uh, think about um, uh, possible other sources. But maybe I'm speaking too much as a historically inclined person. Maybe the question was more about ideology and epistemology, which I did not address. So I think I tried to say it a little bit, but I will I will stop talking now. It's too much. Yeah. Thank you. No, but I think that's that it itself is an important point to to identify, right? The difference between um, inheriting them as records and then engaging in the act of recording, you know, and I think the exhibition um, becomes an important engagement in that. It, it becomes um, the act of recording and, you know, um, asking for people to interpret the images. And I think there is then a question here by Priya, um, who's asking about the process of whittling down the final pictures for the virtual <laughs> exhibition. What was it like? Uh, what were the deciding factors as to which pictures made the cut? It was tough. <laughs> yeah. Who decided on those 50 images in 50 images? It was very tough. Um, I think um, I'm speaking for myself. Uh, and so and, and so 50 means, you know, you divide it by four. And, and you know, so there was a lot of negotiation. And, and therefore, you see level one and level two images and, and, and so um, and so on. So I mean, personally, for me, is, um, you know, as, as with also, you know, in any um, research, you know, when you say, when I, you know, I think, oh, I must interview so-and-so and yet one more and yet one more. I mean, like, um, I, uh, you know, that, that there comes a point where then, you know, less is more, I think, um, because I was overwhelmed. I was really overwhelmed uh, with that. So when, if it, 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 it just uh, um, it was enough for me to say what I wanted to uh, uh, say and bring across, you know, I was happy to stick to my what was it? it um, eleven photographs for eleven <laughs> for level one for level one. Something like that. Yes. Something like that. Eleven, I think. Yeah, we were we were asked to whittle down. We had very ambitious numbers initially. Obviously, that was too much. So, uh, I think what what we tried to do was that uh, we tried to cluster the images that we had into certain themes that we want to foreground, and then out of that, we have we were we forced ourselves to okay maybe one representative image from that theme that we wanted to explore. It was more or less how it happened. But as you know, there's, it's, there's never a perfect solution when you have to select. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for like one final question. Um, before that, actually, there is um, a question by Hin who said that they're very impressed with the collection of pictures used. Um, is there someone they can approach in the department for assistance looking at some pictures that you may have of their own family? History research, uh, related to movements of some royal sultans to Singapore to settle. So, Hien, um, if you want to maybe, I don't know, contact anyone from the department, I think you can. Yeah, I think Hattie will um, respond to your question there. So a final question um, we have is to both or Dr. Imran and Dr. Suryani. Did you come across any images of women at leisure what kinds of activities were they engaged in? Were they candid or staged? The images you've highlighted today show women um, in labor of doing something productive. For example, girls learning at schools, women as budianta, producers of music or musicians, women being employed or doing kitchen work marketing. I'm trying to recall those many <laughs> images. Um, Imran, did, I mean, uh, you would have, right? I mean, I think you know, like, uh, uh, come across those those um, images where women, yeah, were uh, were um, involved in these activities. Maybe, yeah, you you could elaborate on that. 
Yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh. What were the images? Yeah, uh, of at leisure. I mean, the one there's one that that was shown, but I think uh, many of them that were not at work. The photo. I mean, images of women uh, that were not doing something productive or you know, uh, they were mostly studio portraits. Mm. Uh, uh, mm. Like I said, uh, uh, maybe maybe it has to do with the fact that if you are at leisure, uh, then that would be a private thing. Yeah. Oh, I will stop there. I guess yeah. Yeah, because I was also kind of wondering if if it's women at leisure, they might be in their own home space, and then if you're kind of questioning who the photographers, if they're male, whether they would have access. So, I mean that that oh. would be an interesting um, thing to think about, right? Like if there are no images of a particular activity, um, then I'm also thinking, what is that that kind of relationship? This, the spaces have with the camera like where can the camera go or where is, is it not able to go and therefore we don't have these images you know yeah I no rule no, if I may just I'm sorry I just thought of something as you were saying that as you were explaining these things so um there is an and this is pre-photography uh Wakato, the famous oh. uh, cartoonist right the Javanese cartoonist at Kampung Glam he had wonderful cartoons showing modern Malay women at leisure at home but they were cartoons, but that's that's one avenue. So that, that, because I mean, firstly, of course, nobody goes around photographing women at leisure at home. For example, reading the newspaper. He had one where the lady was reading the newspaper, and then another one reading a novel. You know, these are wonderful images showing women at leisure reading at home. But anyway, I I just thought about that. That so image perhaps because we focus on photography. Maybe my point is that there are a plethora of other visual forms that maybe we could think about. Uh, besides photography, mm. and a rare example, a, a rare individual like Wakato, who is a Malay, uh, a Javanese cartoonist in Singapore, that's something that I, I think uh, that there's a researcher in Malaysia looking at his work, but nobody in Singapore. I think uh, his great granddaughter, or is it grand, gr- granddaughter or great granddaughter, uh, Zuraida Isan, tried to do something. So I hope that she continues working on what she wants to do about the images. Yeah. Mm. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, I think we will come to the end of our q and I would like to invite Cathy back in to close the session for today. Cathy? Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for the session, Dr. Imran and Dr. Suryani. It was really illuminating. And Nurul, really many thanks from Atikweda and from the researchers and from the presenters today for your really insightful and sensitive uh, moderation and of handling all those questions. Um, Which also brings me to our audience. Please accept our thanks on behalf of uh, all the researchers for the attention that you've paid to the presentations and for the questions, which I think, again, as with the first seminar that we had, really deepened and widened the conversation today. And I think the researchers will take back a lot, as much as I'm sure they've given to all of us, they will take back a lot as well from the questions that you've presented. Um, I've, uh, we have together now the entire, the full super researcher team, uh, which is, of course, Dr. Masna, Dr. Baha, Dr. Sriani, Dr. Imran. And um, we just want to thank them for the attention and the work that they've put into this project over the past uh, two years. The exhibition will be on until the 31st of August. It's interactive, it's fun, it's meant for the general reader, although I'm sure the viewers today will also find something in there that will be useful to them. So please do uh, visit visit the website um, and take part in the questions that we've asked. Um, I'd also, before uh, we end, I'd also like to just express our thanks to Sheila and Sammy from Equal Dreams, who've actually been working behind the scenes really valiantly providing text interpretation for the deaf and hard of hearing community so that they uh, the session today was accessible. The, um, the text that they've done will also be published together with both the seminars that we've uh, that we've organized and these will be put up on Articulator shortly. So you can either follow us on social media to receive updates or you can also sign up for our newsletter so that you will get information about when we upload the seminar if you'd like to share it with friends of yours who've missed it. Um, and with that, I think we'll bring the evening, the afternoon to a close and um, just join me in thanking our presenters again and thank you everyone and have a good afternoon. <laughs>